And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. For two days, he silently watched the happy Natalia, then evidently softened in his attitude. Natalia, he called to her. Well, my little granddaughter, so you're very happy, ah? Uh? I don't rightly know myself, granddad, Natalia confided. Well, well, Christ be with you. God grant. And he bitterly and spitefully upbraided her. I didn't think you'd be going off while I was alive. My life will be bitter without you. Mitka was listening to their talk, and he remarked, You're likely to live another hundred years, grandfather, and is she to wait all that time? You're a fine one. The old man turned almost purple with anger. He rapped with his stick and feet. Clear off, you son of a bitch. Clear off, I say, you devil's demon. Who told you to listen? The wedding was fixed to take place on the first day after the feast. On the day of the Assumption, Gregor came to visit his future bride. He sat at the round table in the best room, shelled sunflower seeds and nuts with the bride's girlfriends, then drove away again. Natalia saw him off. Under the roof of the shed where his horse was standing, saddled with a smart new saddle, she slipped her hand into her breast, and flushing, gazing at him with eyes expressive of her love, she thrust a soft little bundle, warm from her breast, into his hand. As he took the gift, Gregor dazzled her with the whiteness of his wolfish teeth and asked, What is it? You'll see. I've sewn you a tobacco pouch. Gregor irresolutely drew her towards himself, wanting to kiss her, but she held him off forcefully with her hands against his chest, bent herself back and turned her eyes fearfully towards the window of the hut. They'll see us, she whispered. Let them. I'm ashamed to. Natalia held the reins while he mounted. Frowning, Gregor caught the stirrup with his foot, seated himself comfortably in the saddle, and rode out of the yard. She opened the gate and stood gazing after him. Gregor sat his horse with a slight list to the left, dashingly waving his whip. Eleven more days, Natalia mentally calculated, and sighed and smiled. Chapter 6 the green, spike-leafed wheat breaks through the ground and grows. Within a few weeks, a rook can fly into its midst and not be seen. The corn sucks the juices from the earth and comes to ear. The grain swells with the sweet and scented milk. Then it flowers and a golden dust covers the ear. The farmer goes out into the steppe and stands gazing, but cannot rejoice. Wherever he looks, a herd of cattle has strayed into the corn, they have trodden the laden grain into the glebe. Wherever they have thronged is a circle of crushed wheat. The farmer grows bitter and savage at the sight. So with Oxenia. Over her feelings, ripened to golden flower, Gregor had trodden with his heavy rawhide boots. He had sullied them, burnt them to ash, and that was all. As she came back from the Melyakov's sunflower garden, Axenia's spirit grew empty and wild, like a forgotten farmyard overgrown with goose grass and scrub. She walked along, chewing the ends of her kerchief, and a cry swelled her throat. She entered the hut and fell to the floor, choking with tears, with torment, with the dreary emptiness that lashed through her head. But then it passed. The piercing pain was drawn down and exhausted at the bottom of her heart. The grain trampled by the cattle stands again. With the dew and the sun, the trodden stalks rise. At first, bowed like a man under a too heavy burden, then erect, lifting their heads. And the days shine on them, and the winds set them swinging. At night, as she passionately caressed her husband, Oxenia thought of another, and hatred was mingled with a great love in her heart. The woman mentally planned a new dishonor, yet the old infamy. She was resolved to take Gregor from the happy Natalia, who had known neither the bitterness nor the joy of love. She lay thinking over her plans at night, with Stepan's heavy head resting on her right arm. Oxenia lay thinking. But only one thing could she resolve firmly. She would take Gregor from everybody else. She would flood him with love. She would possess him as before she had possessed him. During the day, Oxenia drowned her thoughts in cares and household duties. She met Gregor occasionally and would turn pale, proudly carrying her beautiful body that yearned so after him, 
gazing shamelessly, challengingly into the black depths of his eyes. After each meeting, Gregor was seized with yearning for her. He grew angry without cause and poured out his wrath on Dunya and his mother. But most frequently, he took his cap, went out into the backyard, and chopped away at the stout brushwood until he was bathed in perspiration. It made Pantoliemon curse. The lousy devil, he's chopped up enough for a couple of fences. You wait, my lad. When you're married, you can chop away at that. That'll soon take it out of you. Four gaily decorated, pear-horsed wagonettes were to drive to fetch the bride. A crowd of village folk in holiday attire thronged around them as they stood in the Mielikov's yard. Pyotr was the bridesman. He was dressed in a black frock coat and blue striped trousers. His left arm was bound with two white kerchiefs, and he wore a permanent, unchanging smile under his wheaten whiskers. Don't be so shy, Gregor, he said to his brother. Hold your head up like a young cock. Daria, as slender and supple as a willow switch, attired in a woolen, raspberry-colored skirt, gave Pyotr a nudge. Time you were off, she reminded him. Take your places, Pyotr ordered. On my wagon, five and the bridegroom. They climbed into the wagonettes. Red and triumphant, Ilinichna opened the gates. The four wagonettes chased after one another along the street. Pyotr sat at Gregor's side. Opposite them, Daria waved a lace handkerchief. The ruts and bumps interrupted their voices raised in a song. The crimson bands of the Cossack caps, the blue and black uniforms and frock coats, the sleeves bound with white kerchiefs, the scattered rainbow of the women's kerchiefs, the gay skirts and muslin trains of dust behind each wagonette made a colorful picture. Gregor's second cousin, Anihi, drove the bridegroom's wagonette. Bowed over the tails of the horses, almost falling off his seat, he cracked his whip and whistled, and the perspiring horses pulled harder at the tautened traces. Get a move on, Ilya Ozhogin, the bridegroom's uncle on his mother's side, roared as he tried to overtake them with the second wagonette. Gregor recognized Dunya's happy face behind his uncle's back. No, you don't, Aniki shouted, jumping to his feet and emitting a piercing whistle. He whipped up the horses into a frenzied gallop. You'll fall, Daria exclaimed, embracing Aniki's polished top boots with her arms. Hold on. Uncle Ilya called at their side, but his voice was lost in the continual groan and rattle of the wheels. The two other wagonettes, tightly packed with men and women, drove along side by side. The horses were decorated with blue, red, and pale rose pom-poms, paper flowers and ribbons woven into their manes and forelocks. The wagonettes rumbled over the bumpy road, the horses threw off flakes of soapy foam, and the pom-poms on their wet, foaming backs danced and ruffled in the wind. At the Korshinov's gate, a horde of urchins was on the lookout for the cavalcade. They saw the dust rising from the road and ran into the yard, bawling, They're coming! The wagonettes came rattling up to the gate. Pyotr led Gregor to the steps. The others followed behind. The door from the porch to the kitchen was shut fast. Pyotr knocked. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, he intoned. Amen, came from the other side of the door. Pyotr repeated the words in the knock three times, each time receiving the same answer. May we come in, he then asked. By all means. The door was thrown open. The parents' representative, Natalia's godmother, greeted Pyotr with a curtsy and a fine, raspberry-lipped smile. Take this for your health's sake, bridesman, she said, handing him a glass of bitter, overfresh kvass. Pyotr smoothed his whiskers, drank it down, and spluttered amid a general, unrestrained laugh. Well, you've made me welcome. You wait, my blackberry. I'll not treat you like this. I'll make you pay for it. Whilst the bridesman and Natalia's godmother were competing in a duel of wits, the relatives of the bridegroom were brought three glasses of vodka each, in accordance with the marriage arrangement. Natalia, already attired in her wedding dress and veil, was behind the table, guarded by her two sisters. Maria held a rolling pin in her outstretched hand, and Agrippina, a challenging fervor in her eyes, shook a poker. Sweating and slightly intoxicated with vodka, Pyotr bowed and offered them a fifty-kopeck piece in his glass. But Maria struck the table with her rolling pin. Not enough. We shan't sell the bride, she declared. 
Once more, Piotr offered them a pinch of small silver in the glass. We won't let you have her, the sisters said firmly, elbowing aside the downcast Natalia. Here, what's all this? We've already paid and overpaid, Piotr protested. Back you get, girls, Muran ordered, and smilingly pressed towards the table. At this signal, the bride's relatives and friends, seated around the table, stood up and made room for the newcomers. Piotr thrust the end of a shawl into Gregor's hand, jumped onto a bench, and led him to the bride, who had seated herself beneath the icons. Natalia took the other end of the shawl in her moist and agitated hand. Gregor sat down beside her. There was a champing of teeth around the table. The guests tore the boiled chicken into pieces with their hands, afterwards wiping them on their hair. As Aniki chewed at the handful of chicken, the yellow grease ran down his bare chin onto his collar. With a feeling of self-pity, Gregor stared first at his own and Natalia's spoons tied together by a handkerchief, then at the vermicelli smoking in a bowl. He badly wanted to eat. His stomach was rolling over with hunger. But the marriage custom forbade. The guests ate long and heartily. The smell of resinous masculine sweat mingled with the more caustic and spicy scent of the women. From the skirts, frock coats, and shawls, long packed in chests, came the odor of naphthalene. Gregor glanced sidelong at Natalia. And for the first time he noticed that her upper lip was swollen and hung like the peak of a cap over her underlip. He also noticed that on the right cheek, below the upper jawbone, was a brown mole, and that two golden hairs were growing out of the mole, and for some reason this irritated him. He recalled Axenia's slender neck with its curly, fluffy locks, and he had the feeling that someone had dropped a handful of prickly hay down his back. He bristled, and with a suppressed feeling of wretchedness, watched the others munching, chewing, and smacking their lips. When he got up from the table, someone, breathing the sour scent of wheat and bread over him, poured a handful of grain down the leg of his boot in order to protect him against the evil eye. All the way back to his own hut, the grain hurt his feet. Moreover, the tight collar band of his shirt choked him, and in a cold, desperate fury, Gregor muttered curses to himself. On its return, the procession was met by the old Melyakovs. Pantelyemon, his silver-streaked black beard glistening, held the icon, and his wife stood at his side, her thin lips set stonily. Beneath a shower of hops and wheat grain, Gregor and Natalia approached them to receive their blessing. As he blessed them, tears ran down Pantelyemon's face, and he frowned and fidgeted, annoyed that anyone should be witness of his weakness. The bride and bridegroom went into the hut. Daria went to the steps to look for Piotr and ran into Dunya. Where's Piotr? she demanded. I haven't seen him. He ought to go for the priest and he's nowhere to be found, curse him. She found Piotr, who had drunk more vodka than was good for him, lying in a cart, groaning. She seized him like a kite a lamb. You've overeaten yourself, you image. Get up and run for the priest, she raged. Clear off. Who are you ordering about? Piotr protested. With tears in her eyes, Daria thrust two fingers into his mouth, gripped his tongue, and helped him to ease himself. Then she poured a pitcher of cold well water over him, wiped him as dry as she could, and took him to the priest. Less than an hour later, Gregor was standing at Natalia's side in the church, clutching a wax candle in his hand, his eyes wandering over the wall of whispering people around him and mentally repeating the importunate words, I'm done now, I'm done now. Behind him, Piotr coughed. Somewhere in the crowd, he saw Dunya's eyes twinkling. He thought he recognized other faces. He caught the dissonant chorus of voices in the droning responses of the deacon, he was fettered with apathy. He walked round the lectern, treading on the down-at-heel shoes of Father Visarion. He halted when Piotr gave a gentle tug at his frock coat. He stared at the flickering little tongues of candle flame and struggled with the sleepy torpor which had taken possession of him. Exchange rings, he heard Father Visarion say. They obeyed. Will it be over soon? Gregor mutely asked as he caught Piotr's gaze and the corners of Piotr's lips twitched, stifling a smile. Soon now. Then Gregor kissed his wife's moist, insipid lips. The church began to smell foully of extinguished candles, and the crowd pressed towards the door. Holding Natalia's large, rough hand in his, Gregor went out into the porch. Someone clapped his hat on his head. 
A warm breeze from the east brought the scent of wormwood to his nostrils. The cool of evening came from the steppe. Lightning flickered beyond the dawn. Rain was coming. Outside the white church fence, above the hum of voices, he heard the inviting and tender tinkle of the bells on the restive horses. The Korshinovs did not arrive at the Melyakovs' hut until after the bridegroom and bride had gone to the church. Pantelyemon went several times to the gate to see whether they were coming, but the grey road, lined with a growth of prickly thorns, was completely deserted. He turned his eyes towards the dawn. The forest was turning a golden yellow. The ripened reeds bent wearily over the dawnside marshes, blending with the dusk an early autumnal drowsy azure had enwrapped the village. He gazed at the dawn, the chalky ridge of hills, the forest lurking in a lilac haze beyond the river, and the steppe. At the turn beyond the crossroads, the fine outline of the wayside shrine was silhouetted against the sky. Pantaleamon's ears caught the hardly audible sound of wheels and the yapping of dogs. Two wagonettes turned out of the square into the street. In the first sat Miran, with his wife at his side. Opposite them was Grandad Grishaka, in a new uniform, wearing his cross of St. George and his medals. Mitka drove, sitting carelessly on the box and not troubling to show the foaming horses his whip. Pantelyemon threw open the gate, and the two wagonettes drove into the yard. Ilinichna sailed down from the porch, the hem of her dress trailing in the dust. Of your kindness, dear friends, do our poor hut the honor of entering. She bent her corpulent waist in a bow. His head on one side, Pantelyemon flung open his arms and welcomed them. We humbly invite you to come in. He called for the horses to be unharnessed and went toward the newcomers. After exchanging greetings, they followed their host and hostess into the best room, where a crowd of already half-intoxicated guests was sitting around at the table. Soon after their arrival, the newly married couple returned from the church. As they entered, Pantelyemon poured out a glass of vodka, tears standing in his eyes. Well, Miran Grigorievich, here's to our children. May their life be filled with good as ours has been. May they live happily and enjoy the best of health. They poured Grandfather Grishaka out a large glass of vodka and succeeded in sending half of it into his mouth and half behind the stiff collar of his uniform. Glasses were clinked together. The company drank and drank. The hubbub was like the noise of a market. A distant relation of the Korshinovs, Kolyevyedin, who was sitting at the end of the table, raised his glass and roared. It's bitter, 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 the guests seated around the table clamored after him. Oh, bitter, came the response from the crowded kitchen. Scowling, Gregor kissed his wife's insipid lips and sent a venomous glance around the room, a crimson fever of faces, coarse, drunkenly muddy glances and smiles. Mouths chewing greedily, slobbering onto the embroidered tablecloth. A howl of voices. Kolovyedin opened wide his gap-toothed mouth and raised his glass. It's bitter! Bitter! the cry was taken up once more. Grigor stared hatefully into Kolovyedin's mouth and noticed the livid tongue between his teeth as he cried the word bitter. Kiss, little chicks, Piotr spluttered. In the kitchen, Daria, flushed and intoxicated, began a song. It was taken up by the others and passed into the best room. The voices blended, but above all the rest rose Christonia's rumble, shaking the window panes. The song ended. Eating was resumed. Try this mutton. Take your hand away. My husband's looking. Bitter! Bitter! In the kitchen, the groaning floor shook. Heels clattered, and the glass fell to the floor. Its jangle was lost in the general hubbub. Across the heads of those sitting at the table, Gregor glanced into the kitchen. The women were dancing now to the accompaniment of shouts and whistles. They shook their ample bottoms, there was not a thin one there, for each was wearing five or six skirts, waved lace handkerchiefs, and worked their elbows in the dance. The music of the three-tiered accordion sounded imperatively. The player began the tune of the Cossack dance. A shout went up. A circle! Form a circle! Squeeze up a bit, Piotr demanded, pushing the women aside. Grigor roused himself and winked at Natalia. Piotr's going to dance the Cossack. You watch him. Who with, she asked. Don't you see? With your mother. 
Maria Lukinichna set her arms akimbo, her handkerchief in her left hand. Pyotr went up to her with mincing steps, dropping to his haunches, and rose again, and returned backward to his place. Lukinichna picked up her skirt as though about to trip over a damp meadow, picked out the tempo with her toe, and danced amid a howl of approbation, kicking out her legs like a man. The accordion player accelerated the tempo, but Pyotr kept pace with the music, dancing with incredibly small steps, then with a shout dropping to a squatting position, and danced around, smacking the palms of his hands against the legs of his boots, biting the ends of his mustache in the corner of his mouth. He swung his knees in and out at great speed, his forelock tossed on his head. Gregor's view was blocked by the crowd at the door. He heard only the shouts of the drunken guests and the continual rattle of the iron-shod heels, like the crackle of a burning pine board. Then Miran danced with Ilinichna. They stepped out seriously and with their accustomed business-like air. Pantelyemon stood on a stool watching them, dangling his lame leg and clicking his tongue. Instead of his legs, his lips and earring danced. Others not so expert tried to dance the Cossack and other difficult dances, but the crowd shouted at them, Don't spoil it! Smaller steps! Oh, you! His legs are light enough, but his bottom gets in his way. Oh, get on with it! Long ere this, Grandfather Grishaka was completely drunk. He embraced the bony back of his neighbor on the bench and buzzed like a gnat in his ear. What year did you first see service? His neighbor, an old man, stunted like an ancient oak, replied, 1839, my son. When? Grishaka stuck out his ear. 1839, I told you. What's your name? What regiment did you serve in? Maxim Bagatiriev. I was a corporal in Baklanov's regiment. Are you of Melyakov's family? What? Your family, I asked. Aha! I'm the bridegroom's grandfather on his mother's side. In Baklanov's regiment, did you say? The old man gazed at Grishaka with faded eyes and nodded. So you must have been through the Caucasian campaign. I served under Baklanov himself and helped in the Caucasian conquest. We had some rare Cossacks in our regiment. They were as tall as the guards, but stooped a little, long-armed and broad-shouldered. That's the men we had, my son. His Excellency, the dead general, was good enough to give me the cat for stealing a carpet. And I was in the Turkish campaign, eh? Huh? Yes, I was there. Grishaka threw out his sunken chest, jingling with medals. We took a village at dawn, and at midday the bugler sounded the alarm, the old man continued without heeding Grishaka. We were fighting around Rossitz, and our regiment, the 12th Don Cossack, was engaged with the Janissaries, Grishaka told him. As I was in a hut, the bugler sounded the alarm. Yes, Grishaka went on beginning to get annoyed and angrily waving his hand, the Turkish janissaries wear white sacks on their heads. Huh? White sacks on their heads. The bugler sounded the alarm, and I said to my comrade, we'll have to retreat, Timofey, but first we'll have that carpet off the wall. I have been decorated with two Georges, awarded for heroism under fire. I took a Turkish major alive. Grandfather Grishaka began to weep and bang his withered fist on his neighbor's spine. But the latter, dipping a piece of chicken into the cherry jelly, lifelessly stared at the soiled tablecloth and mumbled, And listen what sin the unclean spirit led me into, my son. I'd never before taken anything that wasn't mine, but now I happened to see that carpet, and I thought that would make a good horse cloth. I've seen those parts myself. I've been in lands across the sea as well, Grishaka tried to look his neighbor in the eyes but the deep sockets were overgrown with a shaggy bush of eyebrows and beard. So he resorted to craft. He wanted to win his neighbor's attention for the climax of his story, and he plunged into the middle of it without any preliminaries. And the captain gives the order, In troop columns at the gallop, forward! But the old Baklanov regiment Cossack threw back his head like a charger at the sound of the trumpet, and dropping his fist on the table, whispered, Lances at the ready. Draw sabers. Baklanov's men. His voice suddenly grew stronger. His faded eyes glittered and burned. Baklanov's boys, he roared, opening wide his toothless yellow jaws. Into attack! Forward! And he gazed at Grishaka with a youthful and intelligent look and let the tears trickling over his beard fall unwiped. Grishaka also grew excited. He gave us this command and waved his sword. 
We galloped forward, and the janissaries were drawn up like this. He drew an irregular square on the tablecloth with his finger. And firing at us, three times we charged them. Each time they beat us back. Whenever we tried, their cavalry came out of a little wood on their flank. Our troop commander gave the order, and we turned and went at them. We smashed them, rode them down. What cavalry in the world can stand up against Cossacks? They fled into the wood. I see their officer just in front of me, riding on a bay. A good-looking officer, black-whiskered. He looks back at me and draws his pistol. He shot, but he missed me. I spurred my horse and caught up with him. I was going to cut him down, but then I thought better of it. After all, he was a man, too. I seized him round the waist with my right arm, and he flew out of the saddle. He bit my arm, but I took him all the same. Grishaka glanced triumphantly at his neighbor, but the old man's great angular head had fallen onto his chest, and he was snoring comfortably. Chapter 7 Sergei Platonovich Mokov could trace his ancestry a long way back. During the reign of Peter I, a state barge was traveling down the Don to Azov with a cargo of biscuit and gunpowder. The Cossacks of the little robber town of Chigonak, nestling on the bank of the Upper Don, fell on the barge by night, destroyed the sleepy guards, pillaged the biscuit and gunpowder, and sank the vessel. The Tsar ordered out soldiers from Varanyej, and they burnt down the town of Chigonak, ruthlessly put the guilty Cossacks to the sword, and hanged forty of them on a floating gallows, which, as a warning to the unruly villages, was sent sailing down the Don. Some ten years later, the spot where the hearths of the Chigonak huts had smoked began again to be inhabited. At the same time, on the Tsar's instructions, a secret agent, a Russian peasant named Mokhov, came to live there. He traded in knife hafts, tobacco, flints, and the other odds and ends necessary to the Cossacks' everyday life. He bought up and resold stolen goods, and once or twice a year journeyed to Varanyej, ostensibly to replenish his stocks, but in reality to report to the authorities on the state of the district. From this Russian peasant, Nikita Mokhov, descended the merchant family of Mokhovs. They took deep root in the Cossack earth. They multiplied and grew into the district like a sturdy field bush, reverently preserving the half-rotten credentials given to their ancestor by the governor of Varanyej. The credentials might have been preserved until this day, but for a great fire which occurred during the lifetime of Sergei Mokhov's grandfather. This Mokhov had already ruined himself once by card playing, but was getting onto his feet again when the fire engulfed everything. After burying his paralytic father, Sergei Platonovich had to begin afresh, starting by buying bristles and feathers. For five years he lived miserably, swindling and squeezing the Cossacks of the district out of every kopeck. Then he suddenly jumped from cattle dealer Siryozhka to Sergei Platonovich, opened a little haberdashery shop, married the daughter of a half-demented priest, received no small dowry with her, and set up as a linen draper. Sergei Platonovich began to trade in textiles at just the right moment. On the instruction of the army authorities, about this time the Cossacks were migrating in entire villages from the left bank of the Don, where the ground was unproductive and sandy, to the right bank. And instead of having to journey thirty miles or more for goods, they found Sergei Mokhov's shop, packed with attractive commodities, right on the spot. Sergei extended his business widely, like a three-tiered accordion, and traded in everything requisite to simple village life. He even began to supply agricultural machinery. Evidently, his trading yielded the quick-witted Sergei considerable profit, for within three years he had opened a grain elevator, and two years after the death of his first wife he began the construction of a steam flour mill. He squeezed Tatarsk and the neighboring villages tightly in his swarthy fist. There was not a hut free from debt to Sergei Mokhov. Nine hands were employed at the mill, seven in the shop, and four watchmen, altogether twenty mouths dependent on the merchant's pleasure for their daily bread. He had two children by his first wife, the girl, Elisabetta, and the sluggish, scrofulous Vladimir. His second wife, Anna, was childless. All her belated mother love and accumulated spleen were poured out on the children. Her nervous temperament had a bad influence on them, and their father paid them no more attention than he gave his stable hand or cook. His business activities occupied all his time. 
The children grew up uncontrolled. His insensitive wife made no attempt to penetrate into the secrets of the child mind, and the brother and sister were alien to each other, different in character and unlike their parents. Vladimir was sullen, sluggish, with a sly look and an unchildish seriousness. Lisa, who lived in the society of the maid and the cook, the latter a dissolute, much too experienced woman, early saw the seamy side of life. The women aroused an unhealthy curiosity in her, and whilst still an angular and bashful adolescent, she had grown as wild as a spurge. The impatient years slipped by. The old grew older, and the young grew green of leaf. Vladimir Mokhov, a slender, sickly yellow lad, now in the fifth class of the high school, was walking through the mill yard. He had recently returned home for the summer vacation, and as usual he had gone along to look at the mill and jostle among the crowd. It ministered to his vanity to hear the respectful murmur of the Cossack carters, the master's heir. Carefully picking his way among the wagons and the heaps of dung, Vladimir reached the gate. Then he remembered he had not been to see the power plant and turned back. Close to the red oil tank at the entrance to the machine room, Timofye the mill hand, Valyet the scalesman, and Timofye's assistant, David, were kneading a great ring of clay with bare feet, their trousers turned above their knees. Ah, here's Master, the scalesman jokingly greeted him. Good afternoon. What is it you're doing? We're mixing clay, David said with an unpleasant smile, with difficulty drawing his feet out of the clinging mass. Your father is careful of the rubles and won't hire women to do it. Your father's stingy, he added. Vladimir flushed. He suddenly felt an invincible dislike for the ever-smiling David and his contemptuous tone. What do you mean, stingy? He's terribly mean, David explained with a smile. The others laughed approvingly. Vladimir felt all the smart of the insult. He stared coldly at David. So you're dissatisfied, he asked. Come into this mess and mix it for yourself and then you'll know. What fool would be satisfied? It would do your father good to do some of this. It would give him a pain in the belly, David replied. He trod heavily around the ring of clay, kneading it with his feet, and now smiling gaily. Foretasting a sweet revenge, Vladimir turned over a fitting reply in his mind. Good, he said slowly. I'll tell Papa you're not satisfied with your work. He glanced sidelong at the man's face and was startled by the impression he had caused. David was smiling miserably and forcedly, and the faces of the others were clouded over. All three went on kneading the clay in silence for a moment. Then David tore his eyes away from his muddy feet and said in a wheedlingly spiteful tone, I was only joking, Volodya. I'll tell Papa what you said. With affronted tears in his eyes for his father and himself, Vladimir walked away. Volodya! Vladimir Sergeyevich! David called after him in alarm and stepped out of the clay, dropping his trousers over his bespattered legs. Vladimir halted. David ran to him, breathing heavily. Don't tell your father. Forgive me, fool that I am. True God, I said it without thinking. All right, I won't tell him, Vladimir replied with a frown and walked on towards the gate. What did you want to say that for? Valyet's bass voice reached his ears. Don't stir them up and they won't trouble you. The swine, Vladimir thought indignantly. Shall I tell father or not? Glancing back, he saw David wearing his everlasting smile and decided, I will tell him. Vladimir went up the stairs of the house. Over him swayed the leaves of the wild vine, thickly enlaced in the porch and veranda. He went to his father's private room and knocked. Sergei Platonovich was sitting on a cool leather couch, turning over the pages of a June magazine. A yellow bone paper knife lay at his feet. Well, what do you want? As I was coming back from the mill, Vladimir began uncertainly, but then he recalled David's dazzling smile, and gazing at his father's corpulent belly, he resolutely continued. I heard David, the mill hand, say... Sergei Platonovich listened attentively to his son's story and said, I'll sack him. He bent with a groan to pick up the paper knife. Of an evening, the intelligentsia of the village were in the habit of gathering at Sergei Mokhov's house. There was Bayerishkin, a student of the Moscow Technical School, the teacher Balanda, eaten up with conceit and tuberculosis, 
his assistant and cohabitant, Marta Gerasimovna, a never-aging girl with her petticoat always showing indecently. The postmaster, a bachelor smelling of sealing wax and cheap perfumes. Occasionally, the young troop commander, Eugene Lisnitsky, rode over from his father's estate. The company would sit drinking tea on the veranda, carrying on a meaningless conversation, and when there was a lull in the talk, one of the guests wound up and set going the host's expensive inlaid gramophone. On rare occasions, during the great holidays, Sergei Platonovich liked to cut a dash. He invited guests and regaled them on expensive wines, fresh caviar, and the finest of hors d'oeuvres. At other times, he lived frugally. The one thing in regard to which he exercised no self-restraint was the purchase of books. He loved reading and had a mind quick to assimilate all he read. The two village priests, Father Visarion and Father Pankrati, were not on friendly terms with Sergei Platonovich. They had a long-standing quarrel with him, nor were they on very amicable terms with each other. The fractious, intriguing Father Pankrati cleverly perverted his fellow human beings, and the naturally affable, syphilitic widower Father Visarion, who lived with a Ukrainian housekeeper, held himself aloof and had no love for Father Pankrati because of his inordinate pride and intriguing character. All except the teacher Balanda owned their own houses. Mokov's blue-painted house stood on the square. Right opposite, at the heart of the square, straddled his shop with its glass door and faded signboard. Attached to the shop was a long, low shed with a cellar, and a hundred yards farther on rose the brick wall of the church garden and the church itself with its green, onion-shaped cupola. Beyond the church were the whitewashed, authoritatively severe walls of the school, and two smart-looking houses, one blue with blue-painted palisades belonging to Father Pankrati, the other brown, to avoid any resemblance, with carved fencing and a broad balcony belonging to Father Visarion. Then came another two-storied house, then the post office, the thatched and iron-roofed huts of the Cossacks, and finally the sloping back of the mill with rusty iron cocks on its roof. The inhabitants of the village lived behind their barred and bolted shutters, cut off from all the rest of the world, both outside and inside the village. Every evening, unless they were paying a visit to a neighbor, each family shot the bolts of their doors, unchained their dogs in the yards, and only the sound of the night watchman disturbed the silence. One day, towards the end of August, Mitka Korshinov happened to meet Elizabeta Mokhov down by the river. He had just rowed across from the other side, and as he was fastening up his boat, he saw a gaily decorated light craft skimming the stream. The skiff was being rowed by the young student Bayarishkin. His bare head glistened with perspiration, and the veins stood out on his forehead. Mitka did not recognize Elisabetta in the skiff at first, for her straw hat threw her face into shadow. Her sunburnt hands were pressing a bunch of yellow water lilies to her breast. Korshinov, she called as she saw Mitka. You've deceived me. Deceived you? Don't you remember you promised to take me fishing? Bayarishkin dropped the oars and straightened his back. The skiff thrust its nose into the shore with a scrunch. Do you remember? Elisabetta laughed as she jumped out. I haven't had the time. Too much work to do, Mitka said apologetically as the girl approached him. Well, then when shall we go fishing, she asked as she shook his hand. Tomorrow, if you like. We've done the threshing and I've got some more time now. You're not deceiving me this time? No, I'm not. I'll be waiting for you. You haven't forgotten the window. I'm going away soon, I expect, and I'd like to go fishing first. She was silent a moment, then, smiling to herself, she asked, You've had a wedding in your family, haven't you? And Quiet Flows the Dawn by Mikhail Sholokhov continued. She was silent a moment, then, smiling to herself, she asked, You've had a wedding in your family, haven't you? Yes, my sister. Whom did she marry? Then, without waiting for an answer, she smiled again mysteriously and fleetingly. Do come, won't you? Once more, her smile stung Mitka like a nettle. 
He watched her to the boat. Bayarishkin impatiently pushed off while Elizabeta smilingly gazed across his head at Mitka and nodded farewell. When the boat was well out, Mitka heard Bayarishkin quietly ask, Who is that lad? Just an acquaintance, she replied. Not an affair of the heart? Mitka did not catch her answer above the creak of the rowlocks. He saw Bayarishkin throw himself back with a laugh, but could not see Elizabeta's face. A lilac ribbon, stirring gently in the breeze, hung from her hat to the slope of her bare neck. Mitka, who rarely went fishing with rod and line, had never prepared for the occasion with such zeal as on that evening. When he had finished, he went into the front room. Grandfather Grishaka was sitting by the window with round, copper-rimmed spectacles on his nose, studying the Gospels. Granddad, Mitka said, leaning his back against the doorframe. The old man looked at him over his spectacles. Huh? Wake me up at the first cock. Where are you off to so early? Fishing. The old man had a weakness for fish, but he made a pretense of opposing Mitka's designs. Your father said the hemp must be beaten tomorrow. There's no time to laze around. Mitka stirred from the door and tried strategy. Oh, all right, then. I wanted to give you a treat, but as there's the hemp to be done, I won't go. Stop. Where are you off to? The old man took alarm and drew off his spectacles. I'll speak to your father. You'll go. I'll give you a call. At midnight, the old man, his linen trousers held up with one hand and his stick gripped in the other, groped his way down the stairs and across the yard to the barn. Mitka was sleeping on a rug in a corn bin. Grishaka poked at him with his stick, but could not rouse him for some time. At first he poked lightly, whispering, Mitka, Mitka, hey, Mitka! But Mitka only sighed and drew his legs up. Grishaka grew more ruthless and began to bore the stick into Mitka's stomach. Mitka woke up suddenly and seized the end of the stick. How you do sleep, the old man cursed. The lad made his way quietly out of the yard and hurried to the square. He reached the Mokhov's house, set down his fishing tackle, and on tiptoe, so as not to disturb the dogs, crept into the porch. He tried the cold iron latch. The door was shut fast. He clambered across the balustrade of the veranda and went up to the casement window. It was half closed. Through the black gap came the sweet scent of a warm, womanly body and unfamiliar perfumes. Elizabeta Sergeyevna? Mitka thought he had called very loudly. He waited. Silence. Supposing he was at the wrong window, what if Mokhov himself was asleep in there? He'd use a gun. Elizabeta Sergeyevna coming fishing? If he'd mistaken the window, there'd be some fish caught all right. Are you getting up? he said irritably, and thrust his head through the window opening. Who's that? A voice sounded quietly and a little alarmed in the darkness. It's me, Korshinov, coming fishing? Ah, one moment. There was a sound of movement inside. Her warm, sleepy voice seemed to smell of mint. Mitka saw something white and rustling moving about the room. After a while, her smiling face, bound in a white kerchief, appeared at the window. I'm coming out this way. Give me your hand. As she squeezed his hand in hers, she glanced closely into his eyes. They went down to the dawn. During the night, the river had risen, and the boat which had been left high and dry the evening before was now rocking on the water a little way out. I'll have to take off my shoes, Elizabeta sighed. Let me carry you, Mitka proposed. No, I'd better take my shoes off. Carrying you would be pleasanter. I'd rather not, she said, with embarrassment in her voice. Without further argument, Mitka embraced her legs above the knees with his left arm, and lifting her easily, splashed through the water. She involuntarily clutched at his stout neck and laughed quietly. If Mitka had not stumbled over a stone, used by the village women when washing clothes, there would not have been a brief accidental kiss. She groaned and pressed her face against Mitka's lips and he came to a halt two paces away from the boat. The water swirled over the legs of his boots and chilled his feet. Unfastening the boat, he pushed it off and jumped in. He rowed, standing. The boat gently breasted the stream, making for the opposite bank. The keel grated on the sandy shore. Without asking permission, he picked the girl up in his arms and carried her into a clump of hawthorn. She bit at his face, scratched, screamed faintly once or twice, 
and feeling her strength ebbing, she wept angrily but without tears. They returned about nine o'clock in the morning. The sky was wrapped in a ruddy yellow haze. A wind was dancing over the river, lashing the waves into foam. The boat danced over the waves, and the ice-cold, sprinkling drops struck Elisabetta's pallid face and clung to her lashes and the strands of her hair. She wearily screwed up her dreary eyes and listlessly broke the stalk of a flower in her hands. Mitka rode without looking at her. A small carp and a bream lay at his feet. His face wore an expression of mingled guilt, content, and anxiety. I'll take you to Semenov's landing place. It will be nearer for you, he told her, as he turned the boat into the stream. Along the shore, the dusty wattle fences pined in the hot wind. The heavy caps of the sunflowers, pecked by sparrows, were completely ripe and were scattering swollen seeds over the ground. The meadowland was emerald with newly springing young grass. In the distance, stallions were kicking up their heels. The burning southerly wind blew across the river. As Elisabetta was getting out of the boat, Mitka picked up a fish and held it out to her. Here, take your share of the catch, he said. She raised her eyebrows in astonishment, but took the fish. Well, I'm going, she replied. Holding the fish suspended by a twig, she turned miserably away. All her recent assurance and gaiety had been left behind in the hawthorn bush. Elisabetta? She turned round, concealing her surprise and irritation. When she came closer, annoyed at his own embarrassment, he said, Your dress at the back. There's a hole in it. It's quite small. She flamed up, blushing down to her collarbone. After a moment's silence, Mitka advised her, Go by the back ways. I'll have to pass through the square in any case, and I wanted to put my black skirt on, she whispered with regret and unexpected hatred in her voice. Shall I green it a bit with a leaf? Mitka suggested simply, and was surprised to see the tears come into her eyes. Like the rustling whisper of a zephyr, the news ran through the village. Meet kokoshinov has been out all night with Sergei Platonovich's daughter. The women talked about it as they drove out the cattle to join the village herd of a morning, as they stood around the wells, or as they beat out their washing on the flat stones down by the river. Her own mother is dead, you know. Her father never stops working for a moment, and her stepmother just doesn't trouble. The store's watchman says he saw a man tapping at the end window at midnight, he thought at first it was somebody trying to break in. He ran to see who it was and found it was Mitka. The girls these days, they're in sin up to their necks. They're good for nothing. Mitka told my Mikhail he is going to marry her. He forced his way, they say. Ah, my dear, a dog doesn't worry an unwilling bitch. The rumors finally came to the ears of Mokhov himself. They struck him like a beam falling from a building and crushing a man to the ground. For two days he went neither to the stores nor to the mill. On the third day, Sergei Platonovich had his dappled gray stallion harnessed into his drozhki and drove to the district center. The drozhki was followed by a highly lacquered carriage drawn by a pair of prancing black horses. Behind the coachman, Elisabetta was sitting. She was as pale as death. She held a light suitcase on her knees and was smiling sadly. At the gate, she waved her glove to Vladimir and her stepmother. Pantelyeman Prokofievich happened to be limping out of the stores at the moment, and he stopped to ask the yard man, Where's the master's daughter going? And Nikita, condescending to the simple human weakness, replied, To Moscow, to school. The next day, an incident occurred, which was long the subject of talk down by the river, around the wells, and when the cattle were being driven out to graze, just before dusk, the village herd had already returned from the steppe, Mitka went to see Sergei Platonovich. He had waited until the evening in order to avoid people. He did not go merely to make a friendly call, but to ask for the hand of Mokhov's daughter, Elisabetta. He had seen her perhaps four times, not more. At the last meeting, the conversation had taken the following course. Elisabetta, will you marry me? Nonsense. I shall care for you. I'll love you. We have people to work for us. You shall sit at the window and read your books. You're a fool. Mitka took umbrage and said no more. That evening he went home early, and in the morning he announced to his astonished father, 
Father, arrange for my wedding. Cross yourself, Miran replied. Really, Father, I'm not joking. In a hurry, aren't you? Who's caught you, crazy Marta? Send the matchmakers to Sergei Platonovich. Miran Grigorievich carefully set down the cobbling tools with which he was mending harness and roared with laughter. You're in a funny vein today, my son. But Mitka stood to his guns and his father flared up. You fool! Sergei Platonovich has a capital of over a hundred thousand rubles. He's a merchant, and what are you? Clear off or I'll leather you with this strap. We've got twelve pairs of bullocks, and look at the land we own. Besides, he's a peasant, and we're Cossacks. Clear off, Miran said curtly. Mitka found a sympathetic listener only in his grandfather. The old man attempted to persuade Miran in favor of his son's suit. Miran, old Grishaka said, why don't you agree? As the boy's taken it into his head, Father, you're a great baby, God's truth you are. Mitka's just silly, but you're... Hold your tongue. Grishaka rapped his stick on the floor. Aren't we equal to them? He ought to take it as an honor for a Cossack's son to wed his daughter. We're known all around the countryside. We're not farmhands, we're masters. Go and ask him, Miran. Let him give his mill as the dowry. Miran flared up again and went out into the yard. So Mitka decided to wait until evening and then to go to Mokhov himself. He knew that his father's obstinacy was like an elm at the root. You might bend it, but you could never break it. It wasn't worth trying. He went whistling as far as Mokhov's front door, then grew timid. He hesitated a moment and finally went through the yard to the side door. On the steps he asked the maid, Master at home? He's drinking tea. Wait. He sat down and waited, lit a cigarette, smoked it, and crushed the end on the floor. Mokhov came out, brushing crumbs off his waistcoat. When he saw Mitka, he knitted his brows, but said, Come in. Mitka entered Mokhov's cool, private room, feeling that the courage with which he had been charged so far had been sufficient to last only to the threshold. The merchant went to his table and turned round on his heels. Well? Behind his back, his fingers scratched at the top of the table. I've come to find out... Mitka plunged into the cold slime of Mokhov's eyes and shuddered. Perhaps she'll give me Elisabetta. Despair, anger, fear all combined to bring the perspiration in beads to his face. Mokhov's left eyebrow quivered, and the upper lip writhed back from the gums. He stretched out his neck and leaned all his body forward. What? What? You scoundrel, get out! I'll haul you before the ottoman, you son of a swine! At the sound of Mokhov's shout, Mitka plucked up courage. Don't take it as an insult. I only thought to make up for my wrong. Mokhov rolled his bloodshot eyes and threw a massive iron ashtray at Mitka's feet. It bounced up and struck him on the knee. But he stoically bore the pain and, throwing open the door, shouted, baring his teeth with shame and pain, As you wish, Sergei Platonovich, as you wish. But upon my soul, who would want her now? I thought I'd cover her shame, but now a dog won't touch a gnawed bone. Pressing his crushed handkerchief to his lips, Mokhov followed on Mitka's heels. He barred the way to the main door, and Mitka ran into the yard. Here the master had only to wink to Yemilyan, the coachman, and as Mitka was struggling with the stout latch at the wicket gate, four unleashed dogs tore around the corner of the barn. Seeing Mitka, they sped across the yard, straight at him. He had not had time to turn round when the foremost dog was up at his shoulders with its teeth fastened into his jacket. All four rent and tore at him. Mitka thrust them off with his hand, endeavoring to keep his feet. He saw Yemilyan, his pipe scattering sparks, disappear into the kitchen and heard the door slam behind him. At the steps, his back against a drain pipe, stood Sergei Platonovich, his white, hairy fists clenched. Swaying, Mitka tore open the door and dragged the bunch of clamorous, hot-smelling dogs after him on his bleeding legs. He seized one by the throat and choked it off, and passing Cossacks with difficulty, beat off the others. Chapter 8 The Melyakovs found Natalia of great use on the farm. Although he was rich and employed laborers, her father had made his children work. Hard-working Natalia won the hearts of her husband's parents. Ilinichna, who secretly did not like her elder daughter-in-law Daria, took to Natalia from the very first. 
Sleep on, sleep on, little one. What are you out so early for? She would grumble kindly. Go back to bed. We'll manage without you. Even Pantoliemon, who was usually strict in regard to household matters, said to his wife, Listen, wife, don't wake Natalia up. She'll work hard enough as it is. She's going with Grishka to plow today. But whip up that Daria. She's a lazy woman and bad. She paints her face and blacks her brows, the bitch. Grigor could not grow accustomed to his newly married state. Within two or three weeks he realized with fear and vexation that he had not completely broken with Oxenia. The feeling, which in the excitement of the marriage he had dismissed with a contemptuous wave of the hand, had taken deep root. He thought he could forget, but it refused to be forgotten, and the wound bled at the memory. Even before the wedding, Pyotr had asked him, Grishka, but what about Oxenia? Well, what about her? Pity to throw her over, isn't it? If I do, someone else will pick her up, Gregor had smiled. But it had not worked out like that. As, burning with his youthful, amorous ardor, he forcedly caressed his wife, he met with only coldness and an embarrassed submission from her. Natalia shrank from bodily delights. Her mother had given her her own sluggish, tranquil blood. And as he recalled Axenia's passionate fervor, Gregor sighed, your father must have made you of ice, Natalia. When he met Oxenia one day, she laughed and exclaimed, Hello, Grishka. How do you find life with your young wife? We live. Grigor shook her off with an evasive reply and escaped as quickly as possible from Oxenia's caressing glance. Stepan had evidently made up his quarrel with his wife. He visited the tavern less frequently. And one evening, as he was winnowing grain in the threshing floor, he suggested for the first time since the beginning of the trouble, Let's sing a song, Oxenia. They sat down, their backs against a heap of threshed, dusty wheat. Stepan began an army song. Oxenia joined in with her full, throaty voice. Gregor heard the Astakhovs singing, and whilst he was threshing, the two threshing floors adjoined, he could see Oxenia as self-assured as formerly, and apparently happy. Stepan exchanged no greeting with the Melyakovs. He worked in the threshing floor, occasionally making a jesting remark to Oxenia. And she would respond with a smile, her black eyes flashing. Her green skirt rippled like rain before Grigor's eyes. His neck was continually being twisted by a strange force which turned his head in the direction of Stepan's yard. He did not notice that Natalia, who was assisting Pantelyemon to repair the fence, intercepted his every involuntary glance. He did not see Pyotr, who was driving the horses round the threshing circle, grimacing with an almost imperceptible smile as he watched his brother. From near and distant threshing floors came the sound of threshing, the shouts of drivers, the whistle of knouts, the rattle of the winnowing drums. The village had waxed fat on the harvest and was threshing in the September warmth that stretched over the dawn like a beaded snake across the road. In every farmyard, under the roof of every hut, each was living a full-blooded, bittersweet life, separate and apart from the rest. Old Grishaka was suffering with his teeth. Mokhov, crushed by his shame, was stroking his beard, weeping and grinding his teeth. Stepan nursed his hatred for Grigor in his heart and tore at the shaggy blanket with his iron fingers in his sleep. Natalia ran into the shed and fell to the ground, shaking and huddling into a ball as she wept over her lost happiness. Grigor sighed, oppressed by gloomy presentiments and his continually returning pain. As Oxenia caressed her husband, she flooded her undying hatred for him with tears. David had been discharged from the mill and sat night after night with Valyet in the boiler shed, whilst Valyet, his evil eyes sparkling, would declare, David, you're a fool. They'll have their throats cut before long. One revolution isn't enough for them. Let them have another 1905, and then we'll settle scores. We'll settle scores, he threatened with his scarred finger, and with a shrug adjusted the coat flung over his shoulders. And over the village slipped the days, passing into the nights. The weeks flowed by, the months crept on, the wind howled and glassified with an autumnal translucent greenish azure, the dawn flowed tranquilly down to the sea. One Sunday at the end of October, Fyodor Tbarovskov drove to the district village on business. 
He took with him four brace of fattened ducks and sold them at the market. He bought his wife some cotton print and was on the point of driving home when a stranger, obviously not of these parts, came up to him. Good afternoon, he greeted Fyodot, putting his fingers to the edge of his black hat. Good afternoon, said Fyodot inquiringly. Where are you from? From a village. And which village is it you're from? From Tatarsk. The stranger drew a silver cigarette case out of his pocket and offered Fyodot a cigarette. Is yours a big village? he asked. Pretty large, some three hundred families. Any smiths there? Yes. Fyodot fastened the rein to his horse's bit and looked distrustfully at the man's black hat and the furrows in the large white face. What do you want to know for, he added. I'm coming to live at your village. I've just been to the district Ottoman. Will you take me back with you? I have a wife and a couple of boxes. I can take you. They collected the wife and the boxes and set out on the return journey. Fyodot's passengers sat quietly behind him. Fyodot first asked for a cigarette, then he queried, Where are you come from? From Rostov. Born there? Yes. Fyodot twisted himself round to study his passengers more closely. The man was of average height, but thin. His close-set eyes glittered intelligently. As he talked, he smiled frequently. His upper lip protruded over the lower. His wife, wrapped in a knitted shawl, was dozing. What are you coming to live at our village for? I'm a locksmith. I'm thinking of starting a workshop. I can do carpentry, too. Fyodot stared suspiciously at the man's plump hands, and catching his gaze, the stranger added, I'm also an agent for the Singer Sewing Machine Company. What is your name? Fyodot asked him. Stockman. So you're not Russian, then? Yes, I'm a Russian, but my grandfather was a German by birth. In a brief while, Fyodot had learned that Osip Davidovich Stockman had formerly worked at a factory, then somewhere in the Kuban, then in the southeastern railway workshops. After a while, the conversation flagged. Fyodot gave his horse a drink at a wayside spring, and drowsy with the journey and a good meal, he began to doze. He fastened the reins to the wagon and lay down comfortably. But he was not allowed to go to sleep. How's life in your parts? Stockman asked him. Not so bad. We have enough to eat. And the Cossacks generally, are they satisfied? Some are, some aren't. You can't please everybody. True, true, the man assented, and went on with his questioning. You live pretty well, you say? Pretty well. The annual army training must be a trouble, huh? Army training? Oh, we're used to it. But the officers are bad? Yes, the sons of swine. Fyodot grew animated and glanced fearfully at the woman. Our authorities are a bad lot. When I went to do my service, I sold my bullocks and bought a horse, and they rejected him. Rejected him, Stockman said with assumed amazement. Right out. His legs were no good, they said. I argued with them, but no, they wouldn't pass him. It's a shame. The conversation went on briskly. Fyodot jumped off the wagon and began to talk freely of the village life. He cursed the village Ottoman for his unjust division of the meadowland, and praised the state of affairs in Poland, where his regiment had been stationed. Stockman smoked and smiled continually, but the frown furrowing his white forehead stirred slowly and heavily, as though driven from within by secret thoughts. They reached the village in the early evening. On Fyodot's advice, Stockman went to the widow Lukyashka and rented two rooms from her. Who is it that you brought back with you? Fyodot's neighbor asked him as he drove past. An agent. What kind of angel? You're a fool, that's what you are. An agent, I said. He sells machines. He gives them away to the handsome ones. But to such fools as you, Auntie Maria, he sells them. Next day, the locksmith, Stockman, visited the village Ottoman. Fyodor Manitskov, who was in his third year as Ottoman, turned the newcomer's black passport over and over, then handed it to the secretary, who also turned it over and over. They exchanged glances, and the Ottoman authoritatively waved his hand. You can stay. The newcomer bowed and left the room. For a week he did not put his nose outside Lukyashka's hut. He was to be heard knocking with an axe, preparing a workshop in the outdoor kitchen. The women's interest in him died away. 
Only the children spent all day peeping over the fence and watching the stranger with an unabashed animal curiosity. Some three days before the intercession of the Holy Virgin, Gregor and his wife drove out to the steppe to plow. Pantoljemon was unwell. He leaned heavily on his stick and wheezed with pain as he stood in the yard, seeing them off. As Ilinichna wrapped Natalia in her jacket, she whispered, Don't be long away. Come back soon. Her slender waist bent under the weight of a load of damp washing, Dunya went past on her way to the dawn to rinse the clothes. As she went by, she called to Natalia. Natalia, in the red glade there is lots of sorrel. Pull some up and bring it home. The three pairs of bullocks dragged the upturned plow out of the yard. Gregor, who had caught a cold while fishing, adjusted the handkerchief bound round his neck and walked along at the roadside, coughing. Natalia walked at his side, a sack of victuals swinging on her back. A transparent silence enveloped the steppe. Beyond the fallow land, on the other side of the rolling hill, the earth was being scratched with plows. The drivers were whistling. But here, along the high road, was only the blue-gray of low-growing wormwood, the roadside clover, and the ringingly glassy, chilly heaven above, crisscrossed by flying threads of natural-colored web. After seeing the plowers on their way, Piotr and Daria made ready to drive to the mill. Piotr sifted the wheat in the granary, Daria sacked it and carried it to the wagonette. Pantoljemon harnessed the horses. When they arrived at the mill, they found the yard crowded with wagons. The scales were surrounded by a dense throng. Piotr threw the reins to Daria and jumped down from the cart. How soon will my turn be? he asked Valyat, the scalesman. You're the thirty-eighth. Piotr turned to fetch his sacks. As he did so, he heard cursing behind him. A hoarse, unpleasant voice barked. You oversleep yourself, and then you want to go out of your turn. Get away, Chachol, or I'll give you one. Footnote. Chachol, familiar name for Ukrainians. Piotr recognized the voice of Horseshoe Jakob. He stopped to listen. There was a shout from the weighing room, and the sound of a blow. The blow was well aimed, and an elderly, bearded Ukrainian, with his cap crushed on the back of his head, came tumbling out through the doorway. What's that for? he shouted, holding his cheek. I'll wring your neck, you son of a whore. Mikafor, help! the Ukrainian shouted. Horseshoe Jakob, a desperate, solidly built artillery man who had earned his nickname because of the horseshoe marks left by the kick of a horse on his cheek, came running out of the weighing room, rolling up his sleeves. Behind him a tall Ukrainian in a rose-colored shirt struck hard at him, but Jakob kept on his feet. Brothers, they're attacking Cossacks, he cried. From all sides, Cossacks and Ukrainians, who were at the mill in large numbers, came running. A fight began, centering around the main entrance to the mill. The door groaned under the pressure of the struggling bodies. Piotr threw down his sack and went slowly towards the melee. Standing up on the wagonette, Daria saw him press into the middle of the crowd, pushing the others aside. She groaned as she saw him carried to the mill wall and flung down and trampled underfoot. Mitka Korshinov came running round the corner from the machine room, waving a bar of iron. The same Ukrainian who had struck at Jakob from behind burst out of the struggling crowd, a torn sleeve fluttering on his back like a bird's broken wing. Bent double, his hands touching the ground, he ran to the nearest wagon and snatched up a shaft. The three brothers Shamil came at a run from the village. Armless Alexey fell at the gate, catching his feet in reins, lying abandoned on the ground. He jumped up and leapt across the cart shafts, pressing his armless sleeve to his breast. His brother Martin's trousers came out of their socks. He bent down to tuck them in, but a cry floated high over the mill roof, and Martin straightened up and tore after his brothers. Darya stood watching from the wagon, panting and wringing her hands. Sergei Mokhov ambled past, pale and chewing his lips, his belly shaking like a round ball beneath his waistcoat. Darya saw the Ukrainian with the torn shirt cut Mitka down with the shaft, only himself to be sent headlong by armless Alexey's iron fist. She saw meet Kokorshinov on his hands and knees, sweep Mokov's legs from under him with the iron bar. And she was not surprised. 
Mokhov threw out his arms and slipped like a crab into the weighing shed, there to be trodden underfoot. Darya laughed hysterically, the black arches of her painted brows broken with her laughter. But she stopped abruptly as she saw Pyotr. He had succeeded in making his way out of the swaying, howling mob and was lying under a cart, spitting up blood. With a shriek, Darya ran to him. From the village, Cossacks came hurrying with stakes. One of them carried a crowbar. At the door of the weighing shed, a young Ukrainian lay with a broken head in a pool of blood. Bloody strands of hair fell over his face. It looked as though he was departing this pleasant life. Herded together like sheep, the Ukrainians were slowly being driven towards the boiler shed. There was every prospect of the fight ending seriously, but an old Ukrainian had an inspiration. Jumping into the boiler shed, he pulled a flaming brand out of the furnace and ran towards the granary where the milled grain was stored, a thousand poods and more of flour. I'll set it afire, he roared savagely, raising the crackling brand towards the thatched roof. The Cossacks shuddered and came to a halt. A dry, boisterous wind was blowing from the east, carrying the smoke away from the roof of the granary towards the group of Ukrainians. One spark in the dry thatch and the whole village would go up in flames. A brief, stifled howl of rage arose from the Cossacks. Some of them began to retreat towards the mill, whilst the Ukrainian, waving the brand above his head and scattering fiery rain, shouted, I'll burn it! I'll burn it! Out of the yard! Horseshoe Jakob, the cause of the fight, was the first to leave the yard. The other Cossacks streamed hurriedly after him. Throwing their sacks hastily onto their wagons, the Ukrainians harnessed their horses, then, standing up in their wagons, waving the ends of the leather reins around their heads, whipping up their horses frantically, they tore out of the yard and away from the village. Standing in the middle of the yard, his eyes and cheeks twitching, armless Alexei cried, To horse, Cossacks! After them! the cry was taken up. Mitka Korshinov was on the point of dashing out of the yard, and the other Cossacks were about to act on the advice, but at that moment an unfamiliar figure in a black hat approached the group with hasty steps and raised his hand, crying, Stop! Who are you? Jakob asked. Where did you spring from? another demanded. Stop, villagers! Who are you calling villagers? The peasant? Give him one, Jakob. That's right. Close his peepers for him. The man smiled anxiously, but without a sign of fear. He took off his hat wiped his brow with a gesture of ineffable simplicity, and finally disarmed them with his smile. What's the matter, he asked, waving his hat at the blood by the door of the weighing shed. We've been fighting the Cajols, armless Alexei replied peaceably. But what for? They wanted to go out of their turn, Jakob explained. One of them would have set fire to the place in his desperation, Afonka Ozirov smiled. The Cajols are a terribly bad-tempered lot. The man waved his hat in Ozirov's direction. And who are you? he asked. Ozirov spat contemptuously and answered as he watched the flight of the spittle. I'm a Cossack. And you? You're not a gypsy, are you? I and you are both of us Russians. You lie, Afonka declared deliberately. The Cossacks are descended from the Russians. Do you know that? the stranger declared. And I tell you the Cossacks are the sons of Cossacks. Long ago, the man explained, Serfs ran away from the landowners and settled along the dawn. They came to be known as Cossacks. Go your own way, man, Alexei advised, restraining his anger. The swine wants to make peasants of us. Who is he? He's the newcomer living with cross-eyed Lukyashka, another explained. But the moment for pursuit of the Ukrainians was past. The Cossacks dispersed, animatedly discussing the fight. That night, in the steppe, some five miles from the village, as Gregor wrapped himself in his prickly linen coat, he said querulously to Natalia, You're a stranger somehow. You're like that moon. You don't warm and you don't chill a man. I don't love you, Natashka. You mustn't be angry. I didn't want to say anything about it, but there it is. Clearly we can't go on like this. I'm sorry for you. We've been married all these days, and still I feel nothing in my heart. It's empty, like the step tonight. Natalia glanced up at the inaccessible starry pastures, at the shadowy translucent cloak of the clouds floating above her, and was silent. From somewhere in the bluish-black upper wilderness, belated cranes called to each other with voices like little silver bells. 
the grass had a yearning, deathly smell. On the hillock glimmered the ruddy glow of the dying campfire. Gregor woke just before dawn. Snow lay on his coat to the depth of three inches. The steppe was hidden beneath the freezing, virginal blue of the fresh snow. The clearly marked tracks of a hare ran close by where he was lying. For many years past, if a Cossack rode alone along the road to Milyarova and fell in with Chacholz, the Ukrainian villages began with Lower Yablonska and stretched for some fifty miles as far as Milyarova, he had to yield them the road, or they would set about him. So the Cossacks were in the habit of driving to the district village in groups. And then they were not afraid of falling in with Chacholz on the steppe and exchanging invective. Hey, Chachol, give us the road. You live on the Cossack's land, you swine, and you don't want to let them pass. It was not pleasant for the Ukrainians, who had to bring their grain to the central granaries at Paramonov on the Don. Fights would break out without cause, simply because they were Chacholes, and as they were Chacholes, the Cossacks had to fight them. Hundreds of years previously, a diligent hand had sown the seeds of national discord in the Cossack land, and the seed had yielded rich fruit. In the interracial struggles, the blue blood of the Cossacks and the crimson blood of the immigrant Muscovites and Ukrainians was poured out liberally over the Don country. Some two weeks after the Battle of the Mill, a district police officer and an investigating official arrived in the village. Stockman was the first to be cross-examined. The investigator, a young official from the Cossack nobility, asked him, Where were you living before you came here? At Rostov. What were you imprisoned for in 1907? For disorders. Hmm. Where were you working then? In the railway workshops. What as? Locksmith. You're not a Jew, are you? Or a converted Jew? No, I think. I'm not interested in what you think. Have you been in exile? Yes, I have. The investigator raised his head and chewed his lips. I advise you to clear out of this district, he said, adding in an undertone, and I'll see that you do. Why? What did you say to the Cossacks on the day of the fight at the mill, he answered with a question. Well, all right, you can go. Stockman went on to the veranda of Mochov's house. The authorities always made the merchant's house their headquarters, and although a frown furrowed his brow, he glanced back at the door with a smile. Chapter 9 Winter came on slowly. After some days, the snow melted and the herds were driven out to pasture again. For a week, a southern wind blew, warming the earth. A late, straggling green sprang up over the steppes. The thaw lasted until St. Michael's Day. Then the frost returned and snow fell, and the gardens by the dawn, through the fences, were crisscrossed with the mark of hare's feet. The streets were deserted. Just after the snowfall, a village assembly was held to arrange for the allotment and cutting of brushwood. Long before the hour fixed for the meeting, the Cossacks crowded around the steps of the village administration in their sheepskins and greatcoats, and the cold drove them inside. Behind a table at the side of the ottoman and secretary, the respected village elders were gathered. The younger Cossacks squeezed together in a group and muttered out of the warmth of their coat collars. The secretary covered sheet after sheet of paper with close writing, whilst the ottoman watched over his shoulder, and a restrained hum arose in the chilly room. The hay this year, you're right, the meadow hay is good, but the steppe hay is all clover. What about the wood cutting? Quiet, please. The meeting began. 